next lecture of computational heat and fluid flow. We started to look at the one-dimensional Euler equations and uh, we looked at the integral form that we get from the conservation of mass, momentum and energy. So that equation 8 to 1 uh, in the lecture notes, that was equation 1 in the lecture last week. So when we make the same assumptions that we did for the scalar conservation law, that we assume that we have smooth flow, so that the functions that we are dealing with are continuously differentiable, then we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to express the difference of the fluxes at the east and west phase as, an, uh, as a derivative of uh, um, the, um, the df dx. And we have the integral over that. So instead of that now, we use then, uh, if we do that, then we can see that we get the same integral also for the df dx. So we have du dt plus df dx is equal to the same integral then for the source term. So if we have this situation, then we can assume then, when we do this assumption that we have smooth flow, that this integrand must be zero because the interval is arbitrary. So the same argument that we used for the uh, scalar conservation law also applies here. So that can be written as an, an I think uh, the, we give the term that is called conservative form. So it's the differential form, but it's the conservative form. And then we get the following. That is, we get the time derivative of the conserved variables, density, momentum density, total energy density, plus the flux function, f, which is a function of u, as we have seen, derivative with respect to x is equal to zero. So here we assume that the source term on the right here, f e, is zero. So we did not take source terms into account in equation one. So that is the differential form. But we can also write that in non-conservative form. So here we have conservative form because the flux is here under a derivative. Or if we would go to a uh, higher dimension would be a divergence of a, of a flux um, tensor. So we can write that then also now in non-conservative form or quasi-linear form. Actually here it is the conservative form. Quasi-linear form we would get by the Jacobian. Here it is the non-conservative form that we are going to see next. And that is let's see that is 3, that we have different variables, the so-called primitive variables. U, they were the conservative variables, and V now, that we are dealing with here, are the primitive variables. We call the coefficient matrix B, and we have then a space derivative of the primitive variables with respect to X is equal to 0. So now I have to tell you what these primitive variables are. And they are V, that is the density, the velocity, and the pressure. So remember the U, just to remind you, the U, oh we have it up there, don't need to write it. You see the U is rho, rho, U, rho, E. But the v, the primitive variables, are just the variables that we have more intuitive understanding of. The density is the same, velocity and pressure. So that is the vector of the primitive variables. And the coefficient matrix b that is appearing in this non-conservative form, that is coming then when we write the conservative form in terms of these um, elements of the primitive form. 
So then it is a matter of um, algebraic, not algebraic, but calculus. So we use the product rule, we use uh, the equations themselves. So to get the, uh, the, this uh, the form, the non conservative form, it turns out that we get a matrix B, which has in the first row U, rho, and zero. So you can almost get it, guess it, guess what it is. It is the product rule. So we have here the d rho u dx. We apply the product rule. So we get the rho, we get uh, u d rho dx plus uh, rho d u dx. So therefore they are appearing here. And for the momentum equation, it turns out that we get uh, this in the second row then u and 1 over rho and in the third row from the energy equation we get rho c squared and u again where c is the speed of sound so that is the coefficient matrix so it is just a matter of um, little calculus to derive uh, the, from the conservative form the non-conservative form. And the C that is the speed of sound and we work here with perfect gas, so that is gamma, the constant ratio of specific heat, and that is the speed of sound. So and well like I write it also what I just said. The non-conservative form is derived from the conservative form by the product rule that you can see almost immediately by what I just said. Um, and the continuity equation using the momentum equation to simplify that. <coughs> And then when you do the energy equation, you also use the momentum equation to simplify the energy equation. So make use of those. And you use the equations of state for perfect gas. And then we get them, um, we can express them F as a function of the conservative variables, that is what we start with, and then we express the conservative variables in terms of the primitive variables. So that we can do. And then we can do, say, um, a derivation um, that is then just uh, using the, this dependence. So we start from this here, and we then assume, and we know that it is true, that the effect of the conservative variables can be expressed as a function of the primitive variables. Just remember what we said, or for example yesterday in the lesson, on the dependence of the pressure on the conservative variables. The density on the conservative, the, sorry, the velocity is the ratio of rho u and u and so on. And you can also put it the other way around, that you express the conservative variables as a function of the primitive variables. So that is what we use here. And then we use simply the chain rule on and on. So then we get the du dv and we get the dv dt from the time derivative. So we start from here. So we use now that u is a function of d. And then we use what we have said here. The same thing for the uh, tracks. Uh, vector, we have then f with respect to u, and we have then u with respect to v, and v with respect to x. And that is zero. So, and then we can multiply this equation by the inverse of du dv, which is then uh, dv du. And then we get rid of that, and then we get, let's see, take that over 
here. And then we get the following. We get then that the DDT, the time derivative of the primitive variables, plus, and now we have multiplied by dv du, so we get that, dv du, and we have still there the Jacobian matrix of f with respect to u, and the Jacobian matrix of u with respect to v. And then finally, dv dx is equal to zero. And the matrix that is appearing here, that is the Jacobian matrix. That is the Jacobian matrix of F of U. Okay, so then we can introduce some abbreviations for, for that and also for the Jacobian matrix of the U with respect to V. And then we can write this in the following form. So that is then equivalent to saying that, we call that now equation 4, that the time derivative of V, now I use this mathematical notation, where the subscript denotes the time derivative in this case, t. So then, that is then corresponding to this, and now we introduce an, an abbreviation uh, for du dv, we call that m, and this is m inverse. So m inverse, and we call the Jacobian a, and then we get this matrix, this uh, equation here. And um, in here, just define what I just said. The A is the Jacobi matrix of uh, F of U, that we have already said there. Jacobi matrix of F of U. And the M is the Jacobian matrix of U with respect to V. So the conservative variables with respect to the primitive variables. And if we write that as a matrix, we take the ith component of vector conservative variables with respect to the jth component of the primitive variables. And if we do that, then we find out, we have just to express them the conservative variables as function of the primitive ones. We get the density is the same, so there is no change. For the row u, we get here then uh, u, here we get rho, we get zero. And for the row e, with respect to rho, u and a p, we get u squared half, rho u and 1 divided by gamma minus 1, where gamma is again the ratio of specific heat. So now if we compare equations uh, 3 and 4, we see that the equation, that the matrix that we have here must be B. So, and that is indeed also the case when we do the derivation of uh, this from the way I explained before, then we see that they agree, they must agree, otherwise we have made an error. So comparing equation 3 and 4, um, we see that matrices that the coefficient matrix of the non-conservative form is equal to the inverse of the transformation from uh, u to v of this Jacobian times the Jacobian matrix of f of u times the, this uh, um, du dv itself. 
so then we have this relation. So then we we see how we can get from the conservative form to the non-conservative form. So why do we do this? It is not just a, a game. It, is, it has a it has a reason. And the reason is that it turns out it is much easier to work with this non-conservative form than with the conservative form. We could do that also, but it is more pleasant that you can do that you like, if you like yourself to determine the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of B than uh, just deriving A is a little bit, you need to think a little bit about it. So it's more tedious to go via that way. So using the non-conservative form makes the um, calculation that we want to do easier. So then we do that. So and that brings us then to the mathematical description of the partial differential equation that we are dealing with. So the 1D Euler equations are an example of a hyperbolic system. So then we can just state that and then we give the definition of what that means. So the Euler equations, then it doesn't matter whether it is the primitive, the non-conservative form with the primitive variables or the conservative form with the conservative variables. They are a hyperbolic system. And the reason for that is because they fulfill the definition of that, and that is the following. It has two parts, this definition. The first part is that the eigenvalues eigenvalues um, lambda uh, i of b are real. So that's the first thing. And in our case, if we write it and if we order them according to their magnitude, can order them as we like, but that is a good choice. So the smallest first, and then the next larger, and then the largest, because we have three of them. So it turns out, and that is the thing what I say that is then quite easy actually, when we have the non-conservative form and we look at the eigenvalues, in that case, of the coefficient matrix B. It turns out that we get the following. The first one is lambda 1, u minus c, that is the velocity minus the speed of sound. Lambda 2, that is the velocity itself. And lambda 3 is the velocity plus the speed of sound. And we can see these three eigenvalues are real, because the velocity is a real quantity, and the speed of sound is a real quantity. And these three eigenvalues are the characteristic speeds of our problem. So we have some, we have a gas moving, for example, in a pipeline, the one-dimensional flow, that is our assumption. And then we have um, certain properties that move with the velocity itself. It turns out it's the entropy that moves with the velocity itself. And then we have acoustic waves. One is moving with u plus c in this direction, the other with u minus c in this direction. It's as if you walk in a tunnel and you scream, then you are walking with u, and one sound wave goes down way, down the way the velocity goes, and the other goes the other way. So people can hear it then at some point at both ends. So that is one point. The number two is we need that the eigenvectors of the coefficient matrix are linearly independent. So the eigenvectors, the eigenvectors, the 
that we call them here Ti of the coefficient matrix B are linearly independent. So we have then these properties that we need, eigenvectors linearly independent, and here we could also mark eigenvalues should be real. So in our case, we can also find that by, that's, that's now an exercise in linear algebra to determine the eigenvectors, like the eigenvalues also. Turns out that you can choose the following, the T1, the first eigenvector, that is the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda 1. And then you can choose 1 minus speed of sound divided by density and speed of sound squared. And you can use any multiple of that. You know the eigenvectors are determined up to a constant. So, the, that is uh, the T1, the T2, that is the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda 2, which is u, that is simply 1, 0, 0. And the T3, that is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda 3, you see, that is similar to, lambda, to T1, just has a different sign in the second component. So it's not minus c divided by rho, but plus c over rho. The third component is c squared. So you can check that they are linearly independent, but we would already have known from the eigenvalues. Why? Because they are distinct. The speed of sound is larger than zero, so we have three different eigenvalues. And if they are distinct, then uh, linearly independent eigenvectors exist. So then this requirement is satisfied and you can check yourself the following that this that they are really that it's true what I'm telling you. So you can check yourself and I call that here 7a that if we multiply if we compute b times in the eigenvector, you will find out that this is lambda i ti. I. And you can show that for 1, 2, and 3. And that means that lambda i is an eigenvalue to the uh, matrix uh, of the eigenmatrix of the uh, coefficient matrix B and ti the corresponding eigenvector. We will come back to this later. We will use this fact. Okay, so then let's see. Yeah, these uh, eigenvectors here, these eigenvalues, they are important because it turns out, as we shall see, that they, if we have x and t, they define the slopes of the characteristics. We shall come back to that later. So the characteristics that we have, if we would look from this point here, we would have three characteristics. Um, they don't need to be constant. Say so this would be the number three. And the slope of that is the dx3 dt. That is lambda three, which is u plus c. So that is lambda three, u plus c. And then we have a characteristic with a slope, say that would be the number 2, and that has the slope lambda 2. So the slope of that, let's see, slope dx2 of t dt, that is lambda 2, and that is u. And then we have uh, one that is, um, say, u minus c, let's see if I make it like that, so that would be the number 1, number 2, number 3, and the slope of that one, dx1 dt, that is 
lambda 1, which is u minus c. So they have, they, as we shall see, they have certain meaning. So this is then related to this characteristic. This is related to the characteristic 2, and this is related to the characteristic 3. So they are the different slopes. Okay. So we shall come back to that later. Now we uh, continue here our journey in linear algebra and uh, define now an eigenvalue matrix made of these eigen, containing these eigenvalues. So we define an eigenvalue matrix and we call that lambda, capital lambda. That contains in the diagonal, it's a diagonal matrix and it contains the lambda, uh, um, let's see, lambda i. And that is then in our case, the order then u minus c, u and u plus c. And it's a diagonal matrix, the rest is zero. And likewise, we can also define um, an eigenvector matrix by our eigenvectors t, i. So we define eigenvector matrix and we call that capital T. Capital T is then made up by the eigenvectors that we have defined here. So they are in the columns. So we have then three columns, so we get a three by three matrix in that way. You can write it, we just put them in the columns as they are. One minus C divided by rho, C squared, one, z zero, zero, and one C divided by rho and C squared. So then we have this. Now we need the inverse of that, so that is a matter of uh, also linear algebra. You can do that, but you can also take help from some mathematical symbolic tool. For example, um, so I call that compute by hand, that is by paper and pen. Or you use uh, the mathematical tool and the ones that are most popular are Maple, Mathematica, or in fact MATLAB. In MATLAB you can um, use uh, the following. So you can declare the variables that you're dealing with as symbolic. For example, you say sims then you declare, for example, a C. Not, it's not a comma, it's just C and a blank. And uh, say the, the R or the row, you call it as you like. And then you declare then the matrix as you are used in MATLAB. So you declare this uh, matrix, this one. And then you compute that MATLAB, compute the symbolic uh, inverse, that is with the command inf of t, and then you get the inverse. This is something that you can do, but the inverse, otherwise in numerical analysis, is avoided like devil, because you could solve a linear system with the inverse, but it is takes more time than solving a linear system, and it is less accurate. So when you do linear algebra, avoid computing the inverse. 
if you need it, you solve the linear system. So if you, want, if you, if you need the inverse in, in linear algebra, say um, you want to have the inverse of A, and then you have the, you want to compute the matrix B, and then you have here the identity matrix on the right hand side. So, and then you let, let you solve that instead. And then B will be the inverse. So the inverse to compute uh, in a, is not a good idea. But in that case we need it, because we need it symbolically, and then it's okay. The result is the following. side this eigenvector matrix times the eigenvalue matrix lambda. We can check that for the first column T1. Here we get T1 and if we multiply that by then uh, the first column here, this is just a 1. So we get the first column indeed and times lambda 1. You can check that for any of the, of the columns that we have. So you can uh, convince yourself that that is true. And the result of that is, that is then equivalent to saying it's 11, that we can express the coefficient matrix B when we multiply from the right by T inverse as T lambda T inverse. And that is equivalent to saying that we can express also the lambda when we multiply this equation by T inverse. Then we have lambda is equal to T inverse BT. So we can, we get a similarity transformation of the, co of the coefficient matrix B to a diagonal matrix lambda. That is the catch. So that means what we do here, what we show here that the matrix B is diagonalizable. And it is done with the transformation matrix T. That is the reason why we do this exercise. To get the angle form. So with the transformation matrix. So from equation 5, um, we had that D is equal to, let's see, equation 
five, and this is just before that, that was m inverse a m. So first from the from this equation here, that is eleven, so we get then that b is equal to t lambda t inverse, and from equation uh, five we get that b is equal to m inverse a m. And then we can also diagonalize a, because if we multiply the whole equation by, and then we don't need the b any longer, by t inverse from the left, then we get identity here, from t from the right, then we get the following. So that is then equivalent to the following, equation 12, that we can express the matrix A as, and now let's see how, that what I said was now forgetting the lambda, forgetting the A, we multiply the equation by M from the left and M inverse from the right, then we get the A. So we do that first, that mt lambda t inverse m inverse. And that is then, uh, we can express that also, call this matrix R, you can call this matrix R inverse. So then we can also diagonalize A. The Jacobian matrix of f of u. So that is equivalent to saying, and now we can use this matrix R instead. So if we multiply by R the inverse from the left, and by r from the right, we get rid of those here, and then we get, we see that we can express the lambda as r inverse times a times r. So that means the Jacobian matrix is also diagonalizable with the transformation matrix r m t. So that means that the Jacobian matrix that is F of U, that is A, A, C, that is, uh, well, that is uh, the A, that is A, is diagonalizable. with transformation matrix R. Which is, as we said, this matrix that is the connection between um, U and V, the U, the V, and the eigenvector matrix T. So, and that we shall now exploit, because that will make it easier for us to solve or to get understanding of the Euler equations. They are a complete system, but with this knowledge, we can simplify that. So that brings us then to the so-called characteristic formulation of Euler equations. So we multiply now the 
non-conservative form that we had in the beginning with B, the coefficient matrix B, by the inverse of the eigenvector matrix, T inverse, from the left. And we use the uh, 11. Let's see what was 11. That was that B can be diagonalized. That was with T. So then we get the following. First we do this modification, T inverse. And then we had here, by right now, in this form, Vt plus T inverse B, and we have here the Vx is equal to zero. So, and now we get in here a T, T inverse in here. So that is now equivalent because the T, T inverse is the identity matrix. So we put in here, at this point here, the identity matrix in this form. So then we get T inverse, time derivative of the primitive variables, plus T inverse B. Now we put in here T, T inverse Vx equal to zero. So that is here used. So this is the identity matrix. So we have not done anything wrong. But the, the catch is now that what we have here is the diagonal matrix lambda. So that is the catch, that this is lambda here. So that means this is equivalent to T inverse Vt, inverse of the eigenvector matrix, times the time derivative of the primitive variables, plus the diagonal matrix times the inverse of the eigenvector matrix times Vx is equal to zero. We call this equation here star. We shall use that later on. And that motivates to define new variables. So you see here the pattern T inverse V and T inverse V. But it's for the change, here for the change in time, here for the change in space. If T were constant, it is not then we could simply define new variables as t inverse v. But we cannot because the, um, the t is not constant. It depends on the solution. But nevertheless, we can define characteristic variables. And we call them capital W. And we define them by their change. That is the following. Let's see, we need more space. The following, that is 13. We say the change of W is equal to the inverse of the eigenvector matrix, T inverse times the change in the primitive variables. We have determined the T inverse, and this is the change in rho, u, and p. So then we can compute that, and we get the following. We get minus rho divided by 2c du plus 1 over 2c squared dp. That is the first component. That is the dw1. Second, second um, row of the inverse times this vector gives change in rho minus 1 over c squared change in p. And the last one is similar to the first one. We have rho divided by 2c change in u and plus 1 over two C squared times the change in P. So that is the change in the characteristic variables. And if we use this, then we can simplify this equation star. So then 
this becomes the following if we have introduced these characteristic variables and that is equation 14 that we have it, that we have well, it's, we write it now, well okay we write it in this in the general in this form therefore it's time derivative of uh, dw with respect to t remember this is t inverse dv dt here we have t inverse dv dx so therefore we will get here dw dt plus and then we have the eigen the vector the eigenvalue matrix lambda which is diagonal times dw dx is equal to zero and that is the goal because this shows that we have now scalar equations for each component so they are of a similar form as the linear attraction equation because each component for example dw1 we have here lambda1 dw1 dx they are scalar equations so we have decomposed the system which is very complex in the beginning to three scalar equations and that is the, the whole point of that, that we then, by that, we have simplified the problem. So we have then um, just um, equations, if we would uh, take this locally constant, we would have linear advection equations. We would have three linear advection equations, which we can solve easily. Okay, we will continue with this uh, after the break, but this is the main point. By this technique, we can diagonalize the problem and get three scalar equations. Okay, so we continue.